lactate. I don't even know how I put up with myself. You read Kafka? Fuck, of course you read Kafka. What, did you read The Castle? The Trial. Oh. Welcome. If you're new here, please know that if you're not reading, you're not sexy. I said that wrong. <laughs> and it's been a whole ass year. Reading is sexy. And if you're not reading, you're not sexy. Okay? Hi, hello. We got some good bookish content today. Some updates. And also, I already put out the video for it. I'm realizing now that like timing wise, everyone's probably confused about my whereabouts. But just so everybody knows, I post all the vlog content because it takes time. It takes time to edit and make that stuff. And so usually the vlog content and book updates are about to like a month and a half late with in accordance to like my life in the present tense. But just letting you know, today is March 20th. It's my book to be day. And yeah, it's been a year. It's been a whole ass year, fam. It's just crazy, crazy to think about. I've met wonderful people that I call friends now. Love them all. Okay, let's go through the book updates first. We finish Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Diderer. And yes, explores the question about what do we do with the art of monstrous men? And she opens the book up about talking about her love with Roman Polanski and Woody Allen and both artists who've made an incredible body of work. Well, Woody Allen has been making the greatest films as of late, but very early stuff and how they've made a huge impression on her artistically. But you know, they're awful people. If anyone doesn't know, Roman Polanski, Rosemary's Baby, some bangers. There's some bang, he's got some bangers under his belt, but you know, had sex with a 17 year old girl. Woody Allen, do we need to get into all of that? Was with Mia Farrow, not officially, but they had an adopted daughter, Sun Yi, who Woody Allen had, yeah, sexual intimacies with. Then if anyone needs to know though, Allen versus Farrow, put out by HBO, gives a very like extensive look at that whole issue if anyone's curious. That even goes into talk about Joni Mitchell, her leaving her children, and really explores one, monstrous men, and two, switches it up on women to show how female artists are monstrous in that they abandon their children. And I thought this was such a weird take because I was like, wait, what about like female, like, women without children. Like, why is it so children focused? Until you realize that, well, she has been hinting that the memoir, the form of the memoir isn't all that great, she slips into it. The middle portion of the book sort of becomes a memoir and it turns into a confession and the fears of why she had issues with female artists who abandoned their children and why that meant so much to her. After that, it takes up the pretty bow that ties up what we should do with monstrous artists and also monstrous artists as geniuses and how geniuses have this, not just monstrous identity, but like monstrous process to their own art making the sacrifices an artist has to make in order to make great art. What does it even mean to make great art? Like, what do we actually have to sacrifice? Do we have to abandon family? Do we have to abandon the children? Like, do we just not give two shits about some of the people in our lives? Do we damage them? What are the great lengths that one must take to quote unquote make great art? Through that, she also talks about Picasso and Hemingway and you get all of these like little snippets and little bios of all of these people. But she wants you to know that that every little bad thing doesn't make a bad person. She thinks of it as like a stain. Think of it as like a stain on a pretty dress per se. The stain doesn't ruin the dress. It doesn't like encapsulate the whole identity of the dress. Although I'm very much that person. Like if I get, if I'm eating and I wear like white and or beige or whatever color kimchi jjigae or any kind of jjigae and like the sauce splatters on me it's game over it's game over i want to go home 
I want to go home. She explores how, you know, one bad thing doesn't lead to a bad person. And sometimes there's art that is just great. Michael Jackson, for example, you turn on a Michael Jackson song, you, your head's gonna bob, you're gonna dance. But at the same time, but like, can we ever forget the four hour documentary about him leaving Neverland? I have yet to watch it, but I've, I, I wanna say like, I watched like 20, 30 minutes of it. I was just like, oh God, why? You know what? Ignorance is truly bliss. But she mentioned this artist that I, I'm very curious about who wrote Mad at Miles about Miles Davis. And I had no idea Miles Davis was pretty awful too. But yeah, it goes on to speak about how love triumphs all. Love triumphs all. It feels cop out. The end felt cop out for Claire Dederer's book, but she's right. She's right. You know, if you love a piece of work, then you understand that love is complicated. Love is complicated. And guess what? People are complicated too. What do you do with that? I think that depends. That depends on how you navigate the world. And I think what Claire is saying is that though it's difficult to sever the art from the artist, you have to understand from a very critical point of view of what the art is doing, what it's achieving, and what elements outside of sort of the artist's self input into the art. What else is it achieving? What is it doing? And how does it speak to the world? With this book, nonfiction, okay, I think I said for saving time, Jenny O'Dell, like the one textbook you need, like for 2023 is her book. Okay, scratch that. Maybe, maybe this is it. This is it. This is anti-cancel culture and not like automatically just one-offing someone and just being like, yeah, I'm not gonna listen to their music anymore. I'm not gonna, you know, sure, you vote with your money, right? But also I think you can still critically talk about a piece of art. She goes into this like whole thing about understanding the difference between ethical thoughts and moral feelings and how we should differentiate the two and come to understand when to lean on one than the other and create this sort of balanced and enriched conversation. Talking to people these days, especially in such a divided America, in such like a black and white, blue versus red kind of mindset, it's hard and we really need to go back to being able to just accept someone's ideas and opinions and move on with your life. Sure, pick your battles, but it's like, life's too short for all of that. And okay, sure, it takes time to like understand where a person's coming from. But like when it comes to a specific piece of art, film, book, what have you, it's important to be patient. It's important to understand where the other person's coming from, understand where the artist is coming from, what they're trying to say about the world, to the world, and try and understand from sort of a ground level of where we're at with the art itself. And then sure, you can like throw in the artist if that, you know, supports your argument or whatever battle you're fighting for. But she talks extensively, a big portion of the book she talks about, for example, Woody Allen's Manhattan, which at the very beginning is about a 42 year old man who's dating a 17 year old and then falls in love with his best friend's affair. I think is the best way to put it. And yeah, there was just like this nonchalance to the beginning. And that was a film I watched at 19 before I even understood, um, pretty much anything, just like life itself. It was before where you could like easily access information online. I was still going to the library for resources. That makes me sound old and not to be like ageist or anything, but I'm just trying to show you where I was at. It was before I could like, you can immediately search up different anythings about people. And Claire talks about this too, in that everything is biography and biography is so accessible before you'd have to like seek it out. It was sought after. To know something about someone, you had to like buy the biography of, you know, that's why there's so many like biographies of politicians. Cause like, if you wanted to know about their life, you bought the book. There, there wasn't, the internet wasn't such a cultivated place of so much information. So she talks about this and yeah, I was sort of there. You know, I didn't know anything about Sun Yi. I didn't know anything about Mir Farrow. I didn't know anything about Dylan Farrow. And yeah, I, it, it made a huge impression on me. I wanted to go to New York because of Manhattan. 
it was through his films that I took great inspiration from. And it was through his films that, you know, I learned about Fellini or Igmar Bergman or basically literally any artist. But he was sort of the Big Bang Theory of my explosion into art and the art world. And yeah, it sort of saved me. I want to, not to say that Woody saved me, but like, if I hadn't come across Woody's work, I don't think I would be alive today, to be honest. Yeah, growing up in the suburbs, I I was a deadbeat. I wasn't doing anything with my life, I felt, and I, I didn't know what to make of myself. And yeah, it was through art that I realized, wow, there's like this other world, you know, outside of just school and like high school and those people, God, I hated high school. Anyway, where am I going with this? So I hadn't watched it since I was 19. And because of this book, I was like, you know what? Let me return to it. Let me return to it. And yeah, the beginning of the film made my stomach churn, that portion. There's just this nonchalance between 42 year old Woody Allen and 17 year old Hemingway. And I don't know, it made me sick. It made me sick. And then, you know what? A major argument, sort of the men, the Allen apologists that Claire spoke with over dinner about Manhattan, a lot of the men would talk about, oh, you have to look at the aesthetics of the film. The aesthetics are what topple over, you know, such a nonchalant beginning to the film, the whole idea of like an older man dating a 17 year old girl. It is disgusting. It's disgusting. But there, there are aesthetics to that film that are just so, so beautiful. New York shot in black and white, specific scenes. The planetarium scene, Woody and Diane soaked in rain, their silhouettes and them talking to each other. It, it's just done, done so, so beautifully. And I don't know what to say. Reminds me a lot of also a recent film I watched by a film by Lenny Reifenstahl. She was a German filmmaker in the 1930s, 1930s, female, director, films. Who would have thunk? And she creates this gorgeous film called The Blue Light. And oh, just like the nature scenes are so dreamlike and beautiful and just wrought with the beauty and also the terror that nature provides for us and you know all of the folklore about what people say about the forbidden forest that whole idea and it's so beautiful but guess what she's a nazi what do we do with the art of monstrous people what do you do what do you do but it's 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 all a balance you really have to look at the aesthetic biography is the film doing what it's supposed to be doing and is it doing it effectively you sort of have to balance out your argument of what all that is not to say that it makes you like a supporter of their work, because I will say again, Woody Allen never paid a cent for his films, except Blue Jasmine, which was fine, because that was actually a really good movie. There is like, all of his later works are just awful. They're awful. They're terrible. But Blue Jasmine was one of those films that happened after Midnight in Paris. Any film after Midnight in Paris is just awful. But that happened after Midnight in Paris, and that one was actually a really good one, because Kate Blanchett, she can do no wrong. She's incredible. Oh, yes, so there's one textbook, one nonfiction that you need to read this year. It's Monsters by Claire Dederer. Out by Knopf. I think it'll ignite sort of a reframing of the conversations that we should be having about art, artist, and how to carefully sever the two. Uh, she talks about Kanye West too. It's great, it's it's a good read. It had me lost in the middle about where she was going. It was a little muddied, but she had to do that in order to make a certain confession. And I thought that was a little strange, but aside from that, the rest of the book is fantastic. And also if you're interested in film, if you're interested in Roman Polanski, Woody Allen, Sylvia Plath, Valerie Solanus, and she also talks about like her early life as a movie critic, which was, I think, kind of cool. And yeah, it's it's a good one. Yeah, so if you need a good nonfiction for the year, this is it. This is your textbook read. Uh, a good reframing of how you talk about art and artist. Yes, that was 20 minutes on monsters. Okay, after that, I wanted something like fun. So on NetGalley, I had an arc of Deep as the Sky, Red as the Sea by 
Rita Chang epic, and it's about a female pirate whose brother dies and must man the ship across East Asian seas. I was like, ooh, fun. I love that. 15% in, I was just like, nope, this isn't it. For second DNF. This is my second DNF of the year. But the writing was just really clunky. It was doing that thing where like specific terms and stuff, perhaps unknown to the lay person, but like there was this moment where they were talking about junks as in like old Asian boats that carried a bunch of stuff. And like, it felt very much like a glossary and it was done through the dialogue. And I was just like, ugh. This gives me ick. It was just sort of written in the way that like science fiction or fantasy is written and like nothing against that, but there is like a specific language to that in terms of like world building and such. It was just occurring in this book and I was just like, this, this book isn't for me. I am not the targeted audience, but if you enjoy historical fiction with a strong female character, with like treasure planet vibes. This one might be for you, if you're into that. As a full length novel, I don't think, I don't think Chang a pig is a great writer. I think the form is too large for her. If anyone gets a chance, I'll link it downstairs, but she has this short story from the Virgin Quarterly Review called The Miracle Girl. Fantastic really, really good because there's a lot of violence in Deep as the Sky, Red as the Sea, which I didn't mind, but like the way she writes violence is so stark in the way that she doesn't seem interested in character development and emotions and is very much like plot, plot, plot. Even like the violence writing was just like, you could tell she wasn't interested in anything else but the violence. But the violence written in this short story is pretty phenomenal in the way that it explores the themes as well as the characters. So that's why I think her writing is a lot more stronger as a short story writer. And I think maybe the heft of the novel is just too much. So that was my second DNF of the year. And uh, I was like, okay, great, what's next? So I started Unexpecting by Jen Bailey. And I think this is YA and my first YA in a really long time. I want to say the last time I read YA was Heartstopper last spring. Like whenever the TV show was like about to come out, I was like, what is this? Let me read it first. And I loved it. <laughs> I didn't, I only stopped at book three, I think the third installment, but this is described as Juno meets Heartstopper. I'm not sure if it's entirely accurate, but it has that plein air about it. But it's about a gay guy who is going to be a dad. And that's not spoiling anything because it's written literally on the first page. And I'll, I'll stop there. I'm about halfway through and I'll leave my thought when I finish, but I'm enjoying it. It's fun. I can immediately see it as like a Netflix film, maybe a series, a mini series, but definitely probably a Netflix film. Like all the color grading is all there, so I'll stop there. But it's fun. I'm enjoying it thus far. It's out by Wednesday Books, August 22nd of this year. Yeah, I just wanted something fun. I'm still writing that like, I just finished a big book and now I just want like tiny fun things. <laughs> Franzen did something to me. I don't want to pick up a big book anymore, but that's where we're at. How did this come on my book two birthday? How did she know? How did she know? Does that, does, does that, do you know? Do you know? Y'all do know? Sunny's book truck. I picked up something from Sunny's. For, how magical, how wonderful. I actually was kind of stuck in customs for like a few days and I was like, it's literally at Incheon Airport. Why isn't it here yet? I will say I've been really spoiled living in Korea. Like Korea is a small country. So post things come in pretty quickly. Like it usually takes like a day or two for something to arrive. It's basically Amazon Prime without having to pay for Prime. It's fantastic. I love it, but it's made me so spoiled. When I was waiting for things in America, when I was, at home, I was like, oh my God, a week, a week and a half? Why does everything take so long? 
But yeah, it's that like bali bali culture of Korea. Not gonna lie, I love it. Oh, also another big thing is like when you're put on hold for like customer service and stuff, like generally you wait like almost an hour and that's pretty normal in America, I wanna say. In Korea, if someone is waiting longer than a minute, something's wrong. It usually takes about like 30 seconds. Korean culture is wild. Okay, Sunny's book truck unboxing. Shall we do this? We're doing it, we're doing it. Y'all ready for this? Okay, when she posted a picture of this, I was like, I gotta have that, I gotta have that. Ah! Okay, what do you wanna see first? Should probably do this. But the March pick for Sunny's Book Chop is Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. What Morrison is this? Is this my third? I wanna say my third. This is my third Song of Solomon. I heard this one's a banger. I'm so excited. Although I don't know how this book club works. It's March, right? March is almost done. So should I be reading this now? Does the talk happen April? I don't know. <laughs> I should probably look that up. But it's finally here. It's in my hands. Oh my God. Song of Solomon. Oh, look at that. There's a sticker. Love that. Okay. And, and, and. Well, would you look at that? Cute. Sunny's Book Club March. Zoom discussion is planned to take place on Saturday, April 1st at 12 p.m. Mountain time. It'll be uploaded on the YouTube channel. Cool. I think I can make that actually. Oh shit. That means I have to read it. <laughs> like now, fast. Okay, sorry. Star of the show here is, I mean, of course, Toni Morrison is always a star. Star of the show. But the other star is this Toni Morrison Evangelist cap. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. I love that. It is so good. I'm going to put it on. Actually, you know what I should have done? I should have done the unboxing first and done the rest of the book talk in this hat. Because it's fucking fantastic. I fucking love that. Sunny's book truck, y'all. If, you, if you're not on Sunny's book truck, you sleeping mad. You sleeping mad. I love this cap so much. Love it. Love it. And I love these. Also just like super good stock heavy bookmark. Love that. Oh, I was surprised that I finished Crossroads in two weeks. I don't know what it is about me and reading, but I become a monster. Speaking of monstrous men, ooh, I'm not a man though, I'm a boy. If you made it this far into the video, oh my god, thank you. Like, you're, you're too, you're too wonderful. How, I don't know why you put up with me. <laughs> I don't even know how I put up with myself. But, thank you, thank you for being here. Hi, hello. Dirty mirror. Fit breakdown. Okay, okay, okay. It's getting warmer, but today's kind of like chilly. And I think this is the last time I'm gonna be able to like wear an actual wool coat. So we're doing it. I feel a bit self-conscious because it's a bit loud. I don't know, I don't know. First time wearing it in Korea, but the Jacques Mousse coat from, I think the collection's called Le Cri. I'm not sure, but it's from his early collection that I got as a freaking steal. But yes, Jacques Mousse coat. Ah, with the big hole. It's like, it's, it's heavy. It's heavy duty. And the wool's quite heavy too. And this new shirt, Our Scope, I believe it's called, with, um, as you can see, these uh, fraying details going on. Woad necklace, simple white tee underneath, and white jeans. And the hair's, I'm getting a haircut later, but with hat, we're doing Toni Morrison Evangelist. Ah. But yes, doing the blue on blue on blue. The coat is navy, if you can't see it, but yes. Back of the day is, what is this called? Recto, yes, black leather bag, 
recto. And yeah, getting a haircut because my hair is a mop. And then meeting my friend for lunch, a gallery, and then meeting another friend later for a tiny book exchange and dinner, I believe. And that's a day. That's a day. Haven't socialized, been out in a long time, and here I am, packing it to the brim. I'm a monster. But okay, let's go before we're actually late. Oh, book of the day. We're doing Song of Solomon. Do you see what's going on here? Uh, trying to finish this before the Sunny's Book Truck Book Club chat. April 1st. It is March 25th. I've got six days. Is that six days to finish this? We are a third of the way through. And yeah, enjoying it lots. Love Morrison's prose. Let's go. some updates me and my spicy water i love me some spicy water this is a mango sparkling aid updates went into the city got a haircut did the perm it's a bit of a mess right now but you know always super curly on the first day second day so i'm just gonna let it do its thing back to the non-flat hair and then my friend surprised me. He showed up at the salon that I was at, and then we went ahead and walked to the sushi place, caught up. There was a little wait, so we caught up in line. It was nice. Sushi was beautiful in like this random ass area. I was like, damn, I need to go. I need to go back to that place. That place was good. I gotta save that place on my map somewhere. And then we took the metro. 
to head to this gallery. A cute little place. It was uh, very nice sculptures and paintings as well. You know what? I'm not quite sure what the theme or what uh, the art was really about, but I do, I, I will say that the f paintings were very much photorealistic, so it was playing with the idea of like uh, new versus old. There was um, playing with irony in painting traditional forms in modern ways. There was a painting with uh, new jeans, that was cute. One with like a, a vending machine. Uh, it's like beautifully done, beautifully rendered. And then some fun sculptures that played with body form in different materials. So that was nice. And then we caught up a bit more. Yeah, so it was a cute space. It's called Museum Head. It's called Museum Head. First floor is a gallery. Second floor is um, like a ceramic shop. And then a little cute tea bar. We didn't do any tea. We just like sat out on the balcony, which was nice because the weather was really, uh, it was a bit like gray, but uh, it was cool. And then we went ahead and got some coffee at this cafe slash pretzel place, but they ran out of pretzels for the day. And yeah, I caught up some more and then went ahead and met my friend Hajin. I love Hajin. Oh yeah, we did some some din din, very light din din and makgeolli, which is like a rice wine. Yeah, it was really nice. Caught up and also just talked a lot. We talked a lot about like identity, choices, thinking less and just doing. Because I think like before we make this choice, we like think and we like overthink. As overthinkers, we're just like, you know what? Maybe we should just think less. We should just, you know, I'm someone who like enjoys planning. Like I'm a big list person. So within lists, I like make these tiny little plans. So I'm a big planner, big on preparing myself, preparing for the worst. I'm one of those people that like, I have all my documents in like a sealable plastic envelope with all the important documents, you know, passport, everything just in there and you know I always make sure that I have like a bag and bag like a little bag in my bag that has like everything lactate stuff like that you know and yeah I'm big on prep prepping what's that what's that saying if you stay ready you ain't got to be ready you know what I mean so it's it's very much that but yeah, we were just talking about like, yeah, let's just make choices with less thinking. It's probably not wise advice now that I think about it, but I think this is for the people who are like in the midst of a big change and they're way too scared to make that jump. Make the jump, just jump. Because if you overthink the jump, you're not gonna jump. It's gonna be this huge gap, this huge hesitation. You're not gonna make the jump. Who am I giving advice? What is this? Okay, we're here for updates. We got Song of Solomon. Sorry, I had to do it, had to do it. We had fun with our blue on blue on blue today, reading Song of Solomon. We just made it to part two on the 230 page mark. Bird's eye view of the book. It's very much just dialogue and Milkman just like speaking through members of his community and realizing what his identity is and why he's named Milkman, essentially learning about the building blocks of his own black identity, habitat and geography, sort of the exchanges and how history is oral and how by way of creating history, these characters speak to each other and they tell these stories to each other as well. All goes back to legacy. It's that, you know, old Didion quote. We tell ourselves stories in order to survive. And it's through these telling and retelling of stories that Milkman survives, or not even survives, but exists and lives within whatever this character study that Morrison is exploring. Not a character study, but a song. In my reading of it, I already understand that I need to reread it because there's just some things that are flying over my head a bit. And I think that's fine because in ways that 
Milkman isn't understanding himself. It's through that misunderstanding and non-understanding that being the absence of understanding that he knows who he is and who he is becoming. I'm gonna leave you here. I'm gonna go take a shower because I am a yucky and maybe read in bed a bit. Be well, do good work, keep in touch.